Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks very much for uh, coming today. We have uh, the pleasure to host Matush Benko from uh, the University of Vienna today. And uh, just a couple of uh, uh, words on, on Matush. Matush uh, got his master's degree at Comenius University of Bratislava, and then he transitioned to Austria um, and received his PhD in 2017 at Johannes Kepler uh, University or Universität. Uh, and then started uh, a postdoc there and uh, then moved to the University of Vienna, at least uh, formally and virtually, although now physically he is uh, in, in, in Linz, I think. That's correct. And um, Matush is really one of the uh, emerging experts in uh, the field of uh, variational analysis and uh, if you ask yourself, what is variational analysis anyway, then you are in the right place today because he will give us a brief introduction into the topic and uh, then maybe even make, uh, make an attempt to, to, to push towards the, the, the final frontiers. So and that's, that's why the, the title is basics, the calculus, and then semi-smoothness star. That's not a typo. That's really... Uh, the, the name of a, of a concept, which is very recent and very useful and very powerful, uh, although the moniker is somewhat, uh, well, unfortunate. Um, okay, and uh, then without further ado, let's, let's hear it from, uh, from Matush. Thank you very much. So, and welcome everyone. It's, it's a pleasure for me to, to be able to speak with you. Um, so as, as Tim mentioned, um, I'll discuss uh, what, I, what we call variational analysis. Of course, we should clarify what we mean by that, um, and I will do that later. And, and I will, I will uh, mention again that I prepared a very, very basic uh, presentation, so it should be easy, follow, easy to follow, I hope, not too trivial. And yes, at the very late uh, part of the presentation, I will go to, some, to something which is more, more new and probably not, not, not known. Here and there, um, during the, the, the basics, um, there, there will be some, some new things, uh, let's say, uh, with respect to calculus, um, but 95% but, but is, is, is the basic, is basic stuff. Um, and of course, uh, trying to speak about such a, such a broad topic, of course, I had to, I, I just uh, selected what I consider uh, interesting and important, I hope, if not completely uh, irrelevant, but there are there are many other other very very important things in variational analysis, and so let's let's uh, let's go for it. So here is just a, a brief overview about what we are going to discuss. So the first part, set valued analysis. Um, I, I'm going to spend maybe 25 30 minutes discussing just this, and this is truly truly basic. So by set valued analysis, basically I mean analysis of set valued mappings. That is mappings which uh, to a point uh, they assign not on, not only another point but but a whole subset of, of of the range space, and I'm going to I'm I'm going to try to answer the following three questions. So first question: Why why to study such mappings? So I'm I'll try to provide some motivation, and this motivation is not not only from optimi uh, from optimization but but mostly from optimization. Then the question: What by this I mean? What uh, what type of questions do we do we ask? What what do we study? And uh, there will be mainly continuity. I, I call this continuity and op openness properties. But the important thing is that with with linear rate. And by this I mean so if you consider what continuity with linear rate could be, it's something like Lipschitz continuity, and then openness uh, or or regularity um, um, again with, with linear rate is some some somehow um, inverse concept to 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 um, continuity with linear rate, uh, rate as we will see. So some con continuity or Lipschitzian notion uh, properties and some some regular regularity properties. And then the, the the final question is how and and there I will I will uh, introduce. Uh, um, what we sometimes call general generalized uh, derivatives, um, 
typically when one cons when one thinks about analysis then derivatives are are like the basic tool to use so we have to clarify how can we differentiate set valued mapping so this is like a introductory part but but i'll i'll spend quite some time on that then i will i will uh, discuss um a calculus um that is if we have these generalized derivatives and um we should we should be in order to apply them successfully we need to have some some basic rules how to compute them and so on and so on so and this is not so not so trivial as as in let's say single valued case so um a smooth single valued case so so there is let's say um there are still some some unclear things and and uh, i would say that the whole calculus was one of the fundamental motivations for for developing some some construction so so these things um, are, are quite quite important for variational analysis as i would say and then um, the the last part will be uh, as they mentioned semi-smoothness star and its relation to to newton like method and here the newton like like method will be um not for solving just uh, equations but inclusions so which is simply, or, or some we can call it also generalized uh, equations where a single valued mapping is replaced by set valued mapping. So this is the this is the overview, and we start with the motivation. Um, so we are asking the question why now? Um, we have we consider very simple uh, optimization problem. We have function which is convex but undifferentiable. Then if we want to discuss uh, optimality conditions, we cannot use uh, gradient anymore. And this can be, as is well known, replaced by the so-called sub-differential, in this case, convex sub-differential. So instead of equality, zero equals uh, gradient at the point in question, we have zero belongs to the sub-differential because this sub-differential is a set-valued mapping. And there is a very simple example, like absolute value, then uh, there is a formula. Quite, uh, it's quite simple. Uh, easy, easy to guess what it would, what the subdifferential will be. Um, uh, but I have also a picture, I guess. <laughs> so this is the subdifferential. And if, of course, zero is is the minimizer, not only local but global. And it is true that zero belongs to the subdifferential at zero, which is simply interval minus one one. So, and we see that, of course, there in, in at point zero, this is not a function. So to zero, we do not assign just a point, but but uh, an interval. I'll try to show you the, the picture. Uh, the picture now. So uh, as I said, I'm I apologize a little bit, but I prepared just this kind of pictures and I didn't put them into presentation, um, as I do everything uh, last minute. So here is a here is a picture of of uh, some differential of absolute value. Um, and let's go back to the presentation. Um, another another. Um, uh, example would be uh, if we consider uh, parametric optimization and here we want to minimize function but we have a parameter p and the the, the, the thing we are interested in is is uh, how the solution changes with the, with the change of the parameter p now in order to study that we we define a so-called solution mapping and if you consider a very very simple example then um, then you you easily compute that the the uh, solution mapping the solution mapping sorry looks like this so it's a zero for for negative or non non positive values and then um, after the zero there are there are two branches and again I'll skip here and show you the picture here in this case uh, in this case this this line here is 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 not here. Then I will have a picture where this line also is there, so I have prepared a little picture. So, so such as said here, it's zero, and here uh, the two branches square root and minus square root starts right. So a very simple, very simple example optimization. Um, very simple example example from optimization, and yet uh, the solution mapping uh, is a set valued mapping. Um, Again, if we if we go even further and consider uh, parametric optimization but constraint, then just to 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 define the feasible set, now uh, we need the set valued mapping, so it will it will uh, correspond to some moving set, right? So there's some very um, simple simple examples. 
And of course, uh, going to even more, I would say more simple uh, motivation, if we have just uh, equation, parameterized equation, again, we want to know how, how the solution depends on the parameter. So we define a solution mapping and, and again, we get, we get some set value solution mapping. And here again, the, 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 same, the same picture, um, the same picture applies here also with, with, with this branch here. Right before for the optimization problem, uh, it, it behaved in such a way that for for negative values, um, um, we have only one uh, one minimizer, and then we have three we have three um, stationary points, but then zero uh, corresponds to, to to local local maximizer, so it's no longer there. If we if we consider only equation solving, then we have also also this point. Of course, connection is clear here. That here, this mapping, this mapping f, it should be capital F. Uh, this mapping f uh, more or less uh, corresponds to the to the to the derivative of this mapping, right? Of, of this mapping here. So that's why the, the solution sets are, are very similar. And one can also uh, realize here that there is naturally a connection to implicit function theorem, right? Which is which studies precisely this question. But here. And we will we will mention this a bit later, uh, but we can we can study this the, the phenomenon uh, with uh, that occurs with uh, implicit function theorem also in the set value setting. Okay, so this was the this was the motivation, and now we go to um, to um, to discuss what kind of what kind of properties we uh, we want to study, and here are some basic definitions. Um, with set value mapping, we, we, we assign to a set value mapping its graph, which is simply this. It's a subset of the, of the, product, state, the product space, obviously. Um, then the domain, this is just a set of points where, where basically this is, uh, this is not empty. And the, the range, again, very, very simple what it is. And actually, um, there are no restrictions. So every, every subset of, of the product space corresponds, represents a graph of a of some set value mapping. And here again, I will jump. There will be not so many jumps later. I apologize for that. To, to have something wild. So if you if you just draw such a set, this is a set, it's a graph of a set value mapping, right? So there's no no problem with that. Um, and another another nice thing is that if you consider the inverse mapping, it's um, it's um, it's defined. Uh, maybe I I am missing here a definition. So uh, it's simply um, to to x it assigns O y such that such that x belongs to S of y. So again, the graph of the inverse mapping is the same as as graph of the normal mapping. Domain of the inverse is range of the norm of the of the original mapping, and the range of the inverse is domain, right? And basically, those two are simply projections of of the graph. Right, so it's, it's it's very very intuitive and and, and very simple. Um, again, see the picture. Uh, we go run out of the picture soon. And this is so the first the first thing that we that we are going to mention briefly is uh, the issue of continuity. And uh, if you consider the, that you can draw basically anything, uh, then what what kind of con uh, continuity should we expect? And so here is a picture, obviously at point y bar something some 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 let's say big change happens to this to this mapping here this this all is uh, always there right so this is the graph and but basically um depending on how we define s of y bar two very different things can happen so here if we take the whole set here to be uh, s of y bar we will get we will see later what it means we will get outer semi-continuity but we will not have inner semi-continuity here, uh, if we only include the point itself and we leave this uh, not to be in S of uh, Y bar, so S of Y bar is simply this point, then we will destroy outer semi-continuity, but we will get inner semi-continuity. But as one would expect, we cannot get to be fully continuous. We need both of those properties, and this is not, not possible to get there, as one would probably expect. So back to the, back to the presentation. Um, now here are more formal definitions. Uh, actually, this is not typical. These are not typically the definitions. Uh, I just I just use this um, to give you some some geometrical interpretation. And what we see here, basically, with outer semi-continuity, then this is the type of requirement 
that the, the sets S of Y as Y is near to Y bar, uh, they need to be covered by some epsilon enlargement of, of the fixed point as of y bar, right? So that's why in, in the example, uh, in the picture, because if we, if we make s of y bar larger, we make it the whole, the whole set there, then we will have this property. Um, there will be nothing too big on the neighborhood. However, inner semi-continuousness is, is the opposite property here. We need to be able to cover the, 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 the fixed set by all the sets uh, where, where y, s of y, where y is near, uh, uh, y of bar, y bar. And, and this, this we get in the, in the example we showed in the picture, if we only make, of course, if we make this, this set very small uh, intuitively. Um, and of course, the mapping is continuous if, has, if it has both these properties. And um, maybe, um, it is good to mention and realize that outer semi-continuity is rather easy, rather simple property, and it, it is related to closeness of the graph. So if the graph is closed or locally closed, um, I'll not go into details, then we have this property. This property is not that simple, all right? So it is, you can, you can if you draw some pictures, you can easily see that this, this, this can be very, very uh, easily violated. And here is a very simple example. If you consider, again, such a, um, like basically this would be the moving set if we have some some um, um, uh, some para some parameterized constraints right and we consider this this feasible set then if the if these mappings here gi are continuous we get outer semi-continuity of this um, of this mapping however in order to get inner semi-continuity we may we need to assume for instance that the mappings are convex in, in X, in variable X, and there are some additional technical assumptions. So inner, inner semi-continuity is not such a, such a simple, simple thing. Okay, and, but continuity itself is not that, uh, not that extremely important. Of course, it is important, but let me put it this way. I will focus more, more on uh, Lipschitz type of continuity. And can after I, this- can I, can I make a comment? Martin? Yes, of course, of course. Uh, uh, um, so for, for, for the optimizers, um, the outer semi-continuity is, is usually uh, satisfied for, for your favorite subdifferential operator. And uh, that will also mean if you have a sequence, let's say X, XK, and you have another sequence YK, such that YK is in the subdifferential of F at XK, and you, you convert, both sequences converge, then that means Y bar is in the subdifferential of F at X bar, which also means if something converges to zero, y, YK, then you're gonna be stationary. That's why this is an important property uh, also from an al algorithmic uh, point of view. Okay, thanks. Yeah, sure, thanks. And so, just after this slide, we will we will focus on on uh, what I would uh, call uh, localized Lipschitz continuity. But here, just one more uh, one more slide um, of of let's say more more global type of Lipschitz continuity uh, with connection to polyhedral mappings. I didn't want to spend too much time of this because it's it's a very interesting interesting topic uh, topic on its own. But I just wanted to mention here that. Uh, well, first thing is that these mappings, polyhedral mappings or polyhedral convex mappings, but mainly polyhedral mappings are very important for, for, for applications. And we have some nice results for, for them. So the first fundamental result is that uh, a polyhedral convex mapping, this means simply that the graph is polyhedral and convex, has the following property, which is called Lipschitz continuity relative to the domain. So just again, we, we, are, we are having, again, this kind of uh, uh, estimates here, however, no no point is fixed, right? So we are we have two moving points. Also, no no local local thing there. They just need to be need to be in in a domain, and we have not just some epsilon enlargement as before, but we have th th this epsilon here that appeared there is now controlled by by the distance. So this uh, can can resemble some kind of Lipschitz uh, Lipschitz uh, continuity, obviously. And this is this is one one fundamental result by uh, Volkup and Wetz, I think, and this is the proof is based on on the Hoffman lemma. 
And then there are very important extensions of this result, which can be, they can be proven very, very easily using this result. And if we have a polyhedral mapping, now this means that the graph of this mapping is just, it can be written as a finite union of polyhedral complex sets. Right then, this such a mapping has so-called outer Lipschitz continuity at every point. And this simply means that we have similar estimate like, this, like here, but this guy is fixed. So it's simply this, this Y bar. It's now a property at point, right? So we have to fix a point. And here, the, this point will be fixed and it's, it's local. So the, the y, y prime will be in some neighborhood of Y bar. Again, I don't want to go too much into details, but this is, a, this is a very, very important and nice result. And then the question would be, what about some kind of inner Lipschitz? This would, this would, this would sort of means, uh, so sort of mean to, to fix this guy here, the one to be estimated to uh, Y bar. The question is, could something like that be, be true? And one can easily see that this could be very often violated. Just consider again, um, so I go again, uh, just the subdifferential of absolute value. And, and here, if you consider, if this would be Y bar, then you can never, uh, you must cover these whole set by, by points coming from the neighborhood. So it's absolutely not possible to be, to be satisfied here, right? So then the question would be, if there is some kind of inner Lipschitzian notion that, that could be true for such uh, polyhedral mappings. And later I will mention that there is some, sorry, that there is some way how to, how to get that. Um, uh, which is something which, which, which I did a little bit of my research as well. Um, and now we go to all bind property. This is a very, very fundamental property uh, for, for set valued mappings. And here again, we start with an example to show somehow the difference between the, between the localized version. This, this is like a localized version of, of, of Lipschitz continuity. So, so to, to, to show the difference between this and actual Lipschitz continuity, once again, I go off and this is the open. So if you consider such a, such a simple mapping, um, here is zero and here you have one plus square root, something like this. So this could never be Lipschitzian on any, any set with respect to any or relative to any set that contains zero because here is obviously a gap and non-Lipschitzian behavior. But uh, if you localize, if you consider uh, only the property uh, around this point, so not only locally here, but also locally in, in, the, in the range space, in vertical uh, direction, then of course you observe Lipschitzian behavior here. So, so then this mapping uh, actually uh, has Obine property at this point, but not at, not at this point, of course. Uh, now I'll show what is uh, Obine, Obine property. Uh, so again, so we will focus, uh, we will we will localize our focus to to a couple of points in the graph, not just not just not just fixing one one point in the in the domain, but the two points in the in the graph to study really local properties of of, of uh, mappings. And here again is a definition. And again, you see similar type of a type of um, uh, estimate. Again, since we are we are asking for for let's say full continuity. This, by, by this, I simply mean that both of those uh, variables here are moving. We fixed Y bar and we fixed X bar, but it doesn't appear here. We need, we need anything near, anything in the neighborhood here. And here actually we can take, we can take, we can take any guy. Um, actually equivalent uh, definition, you can, you can also take Y prime from, from, from V. But for some reason, it is more suitable to consider this one, as um, we'll maybe see later. So, so this type of this type of uh, estimate again here we, we see that this um, this is this is controlled by by a multiple of of, of difference of arguments. So this is precisely uh, similar to, to standard Lipschitzness. And here we also uh, we can also define a so-called Lipschitz modulus. Which is simply that you get infimum of, of kappas such that you consider all triples uh, in kappa the number and two neighborhoods that satisfy this 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 type of estimate. Here again, this means if there are no set, there is no such triple satisfying this. This precisely means that 
the mapping doesn't have Aubine property. And then this infimum by definition would be plus infinity. So it would also, um, you can also say that the, the mapping has Aubine property if this number is finite, it doesn't have the Aubine property if the number is plus infinity, right? And then we, we are going to, uh, we are coming to metric regularity, which as we will see is, is a inverse property in a sense of, of Aubine property. But here, here we begin with some interpretation of what we, what we just saw. If we consider a point in a neighborhood, then if, if this is an empty set, we get no, we get no information. Um, if, however, there exists Y prime such as uh, uh, X is, uh, X is uh, here, then by, by what we have here, sorry, then X is in this set and it's also, we started from, from a neighborhood, then we get the estimate. What does it mean? It simply means uh, existence of a point at uh, S, Y, such that the distance of, of the new guy to the, to the one that we, we started with is controlled by kappa times distance of these two arguments. So putting those things together, we simply, we in, in another, we can use a different language to describe the same property. Distance, of course, actually this is not completely uh, equivalent. One has to be careful with some closeness. And so I, I skip this kind of technical assumption. So do not take, you know, any statement here is 100% uh, true. So be, be a little bit careful because I skipped a lot of technical details, but you get, you get this uh, inequality, the distance of X to S, Y is controlled by, by this distance. Here, again, as I said, if this is an empty set, uh, right, uh, we get, ah, uh, sorry, I, um, this, there is some mistake here, S of Y, um, yeah, this should be, this should be S minus one here, right? Um, yeah. So if this is an empty set, this by definition would be would be plus infinity. So it says nothing. We have no statement. If it's not empty, then then we get the statement. And so if we now try to uh, try to say try to um, formulate this this inequality in in uh, language of the inverse mapping then we will precisely get metric regularity. And here the definition is that that thing is metrically regular. Again, similarly, we have a number, we have two neighborhoods and precisely this kind of, uh, this kind of estimate, right? You see that uh, here you can write it as, uh, as S minus one, again, minus one, right? So, so, so this would precisely correspond to this. And we also define regularity model. So um, we have all by property and metric regularity. This, uh, these things, as I suggested, and I will, I will include also the theorem, are mutually mutually inverse, so to speak, and they are very very fundamental in, in the area of variational analysis. And and one more notion uh, closely related is openness, or so called openness with with uh, linear rate, and uh, also the the known the famous result Banach open mapping theorem are all related to, to, to regularity. So metric regularity is actually, again, equivalent to so-called openness with a linear rate. This, uh, one, can, one can understand openness as inverse to continuity. So the Aubin property would be continuity with linear rate and regularity, the inverse thing, would be somehow openness with linear rate. Um, and, and here I offer uh, an important realization or interpretation uh, that uh, metric uh, of metric regularity. And it is that if, if, if you, you have some iterate or something which is here, here X, and you want, to, you want to know how far away you are to some solution set, if you consider this is a single value mapping and this would be zero, you are trying to solve just a simple uh, equation, then you can control how far with your current iterate or current point to the solution set you are uh, in terms of the residual. This is something, this is computable. So this is unknown to you. You have, you have no idea how far you are. You do not know the solution set, right? If you are, some, uh, you, you are trying to get there, let's say algorithmically, you do not know this quantity, but the, the property of metric regularity um, uh, assures, uh, gives you a guarantee that you can measure how far you are. You, you are proportionally, um, 
to to the to the residual which if you have again some some uh, single valued function here you just plug in what is f of x and how far you are from zero let's say right so this is the rigid residual so it's also like algorithmically very very important property okay and here a more more detailed um, comparison and it's it's a connection to inverse function theorem i already mentioned implicit function theorem again those two are very closely related so now if you just a very informal uh, brief discussion on inverse function theorem um here there are this is a single valid mapping then and you are just solving this kind of uh, equation or considering this kind of equation and then if this is if this derivative is non non singular then you get that uh, derivative of the inverse can be is basically inverse of the of the derivative and not only at point not only at this point but also on the neighborhood so this is in essence inverse uh, inverse function theorem and the idea somehow behind this is if here the derivative is it's not correct to say non-zero in, in the single valued case it's non-zero it's somehow non-degenerate then this means the derivative of the inverse is bounded so this is this can geometrically be very clear right and here, further developing these ideas, if f is, is regular, then the inverse is Lipschitz continuous. Um, you know, boundedness of derivative is, is related to Lipschitz continuity, right? Um, um, but here we, we see that this, this uh, paradigm is, is, uh, doesn't require any single valuedness or, or continuous differentiability any of these any of these uh, things we have in, in the standard in inverse function theorem and the result here is that mapping is metrically regular so we have this regularity if and only if the inverse has the Olbein property which is like the existence right and the, the the two moduli are actually equal so this is a, this is again very very fundamental result of, of, of variation analysis um, and now we just mention uh, quite briefly some um, because there are, I, I only mentioned two uh, notions in more detail where I, where I uh, presented the, the definitions. There are plenty of notions and I don't want to go into any, any details because it would be impossible, but just to, to see some relations uh, among them. Um, can, you, can you see this, this picture well? Because I just took it from, from, from a paper and put it there as a, as a, as a picture. I hope, it's, I hope it's visible. Yes. Yeah, okay, thanks. And so there we had Obain property, which is here. And what are some other uh, related notions? So if you have basically a single valued Lipschitzian function, I, it's called single valued Lipschitz localization. Let's just consider a single valued Lipschitz function. Then we have both Obain property and also so-called isolated calmness. This isolated uh, refers to some, something being um, S of Y bar being simply a singleton. Um, and they bo both of those properties, we will we will mention them uh, later because they have nice characterizations through generalized derivatives. But both of them uh, imply the so-called first order sufficient condition uh, for calmness. And then this further, as as the name suggests, implies calmness. And um, uh, calmness is is uh, an important notion because it. Um, it, uh, it plays, it is a crucial assumption for, for calculus, as we, will, as we will discuss later. So in order to develop all these calculus rules in which we are interested, calmness is, is the assumption that, that appears there. And, and there, are, there are also other reasons why, why it is important, but calmness here is, is, um, seems to be very important. And what, what calmness means, Sometimes there are, there are also names uh, Lipschitz upper semi-continuity or Lipschitz outer semi-continuity. And it is, it is precisely related to like Lipschitzness, but only like outer Lipschitzness. So this would mean that if we have this kind of um, estimates, we would fix this guy here. As we had outer semi-continuity, uh, there it was that, that this guy here would be fixed to Y bar. Right, so it's not so not so restrictive. It doesn't have to be uh, satisfied uh, for all guys in the neighborhood. Only if we if we fix y to y bar, this would be this would be somehow calmness or Lipschitz uh, other semi continuity. And there is also the the inner um, the inner paradigm that one could explore. Um, um, here, inner calmness 
um, was also defined like a lower uh, Lipschitz lower semi-continuity, or it could be also also called uh, Lipschitz inner semi-continuity. And again, this would somehow let's say somehow correspond to the to the situation where we fix you know this guy to y bar. Again, this would be a much much more uh, restrictive uh, assumption. Even inner semi-continuity uh, is is restricted. This would be some kind of inner semi-continuity with additional rate, right? This would be. It's not really precise, but you can consider it very, you know, generally as some kind of outer semi-continuity with uh, Lipschitzian linear linear rate. Um, and there are plenty other notions, and um, and this is uh, these three notions nobody nobody else knows because these are things that I invented, and of course they are not as essential as the other notions, but um, and they they play some role in in in, in calculus and. Uh, one more thing to mention that inner calmness star, it's it's um, it's much milder than, than than inner calmness, and for instance, this inner calmness star is satisfied for um, polyhedral mappings. As I as I mentioned here, I'll come back. Um, so we saw that inner Lipschitzness would 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 somehow never work. Even the subdifferential exam uh, example shows this, but. Precisely, this inner calmness star actually works here, and, and polyhedral mappings uh, enjoy this, this property. So that's one way, one reason why it's somehow a little bit uh, relevant. I would say the other thing is uh, that it's um, it plays similar role for 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 calculus as calmness, but much much less important, of course, but similar in nature. So these are some some just to give you an idea. There are plenty of plenty of notions and, and uh, all kinds of relations among them. And this is in the language of Lipschitzness, just as well. Everything you know uh, works. Uh, it has its counterpart in in uh, the regularity world, right? So if a mapping has this property, this property, then the inverse mapping has this property, and everything on its everything is on its place, right? So. Here we had calmness, and calmness is inverse equivalent of metric subregularity, right? And 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 all the picture here. These are less known, less developed things. Uh, some you can find it under hemiregularity or semiregularity. And these three, which are so since these these notions are, are my invention, so to, then these are not even defined yet. And of course, by no means these notions are as important and prominent as as the others, of course. Um, and uh, now the question now the question is how uh, how do we study these, these these properties and yeah the first idea to clarify that analysis is inherently uh, maybe not inherently but it's strongly connected to derivatives but some some uh, some remarks why not why it's not necessary this way why, why we can do let's say do analysis why we can analyze let's say set valued mappings also without derivatives and as we saw, some 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 very important and fundamental principles are are derivative free, and I said it uh, Lipschitzian nature, and we saw this with with uh, with uh, implicit or inverse function theorem, or it was a, a suggestion uh, that this might be true. Um, again, regularity. When one thinks about regularity, typically in the in the standard single values, the single valued case in the standard classical analysis. You need derivative to even say what what do you mean by regularity, right? It somehow is related to non-degeneracy of the derivative. But here, if you approach this from set value to perspective, this this enables you to 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 work with regularity directly without uh, using any derivatives, and so you can apply this. You can you can get the result in 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 uh, metric spaces, let's say. Um, but of course, we will not uh, abandon derivatives completely, and they are still very useful. So the question is then, how can we differentiate set-valued mappings? And the answer is through uh, tangents and, and normals to the graph. Here, just to, uh, I'll very briefly skip through this. So the tangent cone, um, we have the tangent cone, we have the regular normal cone, limiting normal cone. These are very basic uh, constructions. Uh, I will show you the picture. What 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 do they do? Um, and then we have also directional limiting normal cones, which is uh, was introduced earlier, but it was this. Let's say it was it was 
it, it was developed mainly by by Helmut Kfer, which is my uh, my uh, PhD supervisor. Um, and here, before we go further, I'll again go to to show you some picture. Uh, so here, if we consider this is this is the set. Here it's, it's the set is gamma. So it's simply union of those two half lines, right? And the question is, what, what are then these constructions? The point in question would be zero, zero, right? Then in this case, the tangent cone at, at, at uh, zero, zero corresponds precisely to the set itself, right? Then the regular normal cone would be, uh, you know, important here is that this set is not convex, right? So this is, this is not in the set. Um, but the regular normal cone would be, as one would maybe intuitively um, expect. Uh, so all, in this case, set of all vectors which are orthogonal, which are less, with scalar product less or equal zero than these two guys, these two vectors. But the limiting normal cone uh, actually is precisely the regular normal cone together with those two lines. And the, the reason is that um, in the definition um, of the limiting normal cone, you collect all the regular normals from a neighborhood. This is basically what limiting normal cone does. And so here, if you look at the regular normals, simply simply normals, it will be this, it will be this guy here. Here, normals here or arbitrarily close uh, close to, to, to zero zero will be this. So in the limit point, we must include also this guy coming from here and this guy coming from here. Now, uh, directional limiting normal cone is not uh, included here, but this would it would only um, contain normals coming from here. So the limiting normal cone in this direction would be precisely this. In this case here, right? Only the the, the uh, horizontal line. And the limiting normal cone in this direction would collect all the normals from this direction. That is, it would be it would be the, 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 the vertical line. Right. And if we if we have this uh, constructions, um, um, you know, in order to uh, work with generalized derivatives, uh, there are three, um, let's say three objects or three worlds to consider. First are, are sets, which are maybe most most uh, intuitive and natural. And but once you have this through these tangents and normals, you can then define derivatives to both functions and set value mapping. So first we go to functions or extended functions. This is not, not um, we will not do anything uh, with it here. I just wanted to, to show you the connection so that you have the full picture, but then you can, if you have a, if you have functions which are of course non-smooth, this is mainly of course for smooth, you can apply it as well, but it's, it's interesting when, when the function is not smooth. And then you can, you can uh, define a subderivative through the tangent cone to the so-called epigraph, right? So if you have, if you have, yep. I'll just, just to, to let you know, you have about 10 minutes left. Okay, okay, I'll speed up. Then you have regular subdifferential, subdifferential, also, also the limiting, the directional subdifferential, and the same applies to set valued mapping. You can have a graphical derivative through the tangent contour the graph, regular co-derivative, limiting co-derivative, and so on. Um, and these constructions first, first, uh, um, clarification why they are important, then uh, Holbein property can be characterized both through co-derivative by the so-called Mordokoic criterion, which says precisely this. And it has also some, some primal characterization that is characterization through graphical derivative, but this is, it, it collects the points from the neighborhood. So it's a little bit more, more difficult. I didn't say what are the, the, the inner and outer seminars. Again, this would be too, too, too complicated, but here, this is a, this is a, a uh, very famous characterization. Um, and again, if you would um, use metric regularity, if you want, if you're interested in metric reg uh, regularity, this is just the same criterion applied to, to the inverse mapping and you get something like this, right? So this is why the derivatives are, are interesting and important. And further properties, as I said, isolated coldness can be characterized by a, by a graphical derivative. And there is this 
first uh, first order sufficient condition for calmness, which basically is a combination of the two if you look at it. So here you only here should be co-derivatives. Sorry, this should be co-derivative here. So this is uh, through the directional limiting co-derivative, and you can if if there is basically if there is you need to verify this for all non-zero directions. But this property says you that there can't be any non-zero directions. So if you have this property, you have nothing to verify here. Here, uh, this criterion tells you that the whole co-derivative, it must be just zero. So in that case, again, this is trivially satisfied. So this is a relaxation of both uh, these conditions. You can also see it as a primal dual uh, condition. And yes, it is, it is uh, as the name suggests, sufficient for calmness. And also for, for, as we saw on the diagram, let's say fuzzy inner calmness, but, but still inner semi-continuity must be here, right? And then we go to the briefly, just very briefly to, to, to calculus. Just in the standard case, we need some sum rule, train rule, and so on. Uh, what do we need here in our, what, what are we interested in? And again, we have these three worlds. So we have sets, we have functions and set valued mappings. Plus we have primal constructions, we have dual constructions. So it's quite a, quite a lot of things and then plenty of things we can, we can consider. But the good, the good news is that it turns out that throughout all the formulas for, for various formulas for calculus, there are two main, two basic patterns. And here, here this is one pattern. So, so let's say inter, uh, intersections of sets or pre-image. Uh, the other pattern corresponds to, 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 to the sum rule, sum of two sets or, or an image rule. So image of a set under some, some mapping with the functions. Again, we see the same thing. So sum rule corresponds to this red uh, pattern, such a such an parameterized uh, uh, minimum here. Um, I don't know how to go value function, so-called value function correspond to this pattern. And if we go to set value mappings, this is violet because actually in every rule you it's a combination of both patterns right so set valid mappings are a little bit more more difficult but in order to do to develop the, those rules you need both patterns right and just to give you a, an idea the first pattern represented by in, uh, by intersection here you have you have very simple formulas you see that the tensions basically keep the intersection. So tangent to intersection is intersection of tangent, or it's it's a, it's just an, uh, a subset. Normals, what normals do? They flip. They flip uh, intersection to plus because there are there are dual constructions. And here I'll not not go much into details, but very common is to as a, as an assumption for these two. These two are valid always. For these two, you need one needs one can use O by property, and and then. You can you can very nicely uh, write what Oban property is here. Um, a relaxation of this property would be that you can also apply uh, first order sufficient condition for calmness. And here, instead of just normal cones, you have directional normal cones. So long story short, it is it is milder and still it has a quite neat uh, explicit uh, formula. But the, the the truth is that what you really need is simply calmness. You don't need Holbein property. You don't need this. You, you need just calmness to have this, this or, or directional calmness in this, in this case. So here, the calmness is, is fundamental for this, for this pattern. If we go to, to the sums, uh, this is a little bit less developed and also, I, I admit, less, uh, less important. But there, again, we have a sum. Again, tangents preserve sum. Normals flip it to, to intersection. So those things, those, those formulas are somehow mutually um, dual or how, how to put it. And again, um, but here with, with here it is even more complicated with the assumptions. Here somehow more more interesting assumptions are precisely for the for these for the tangents. This uh, this way it holds it holds uh, for free. but to get this inclusion, and here, uh, what you really need is inner calmness star. And so this was my motivation when I invented this 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 notion was to get the opposite inclusion here. And so it has some some nice some nice consequences, but um, admittedly it's not as important as as this this other uh, principle. Um, and then again, for for applications, it's uh, very simple. You have you want to minimize sum of function. Of course, you need you need to know what the subdifferential of sum is. If you have uh, let's say nonlinear programs, 
so you have you are minimizing something and you have equality constraints inequality constraints then the feasible set will be precisely can be written as a pre-image and then the kkt condition so first you have the zero belongs to gradient plus normal to the feasible set but what the hell is that and here using calculus for 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 this guy the pre-image rule you get that this is simply gradient of this times normal code to come to a simple set here in order to get that you you, you can use obine property as we discussed and this is precisely what is the so-called mangazarian from its constraint qualification and here this guy you can you can this is a product you can you can uh, split it into h and g and you get precisely the multipliers normal cone to zero is simply the full set these are the equality constraints uh corresponding multipliers here R minus, you get normal con to R minus, you get R plus. So of course there are sign constraints for inequality uh, multipliers, multipliers corresponding to inequality constraints. And the last thing, uh, very briefly, um, the semi-smoothness star and the news and method. So um, I, will, I will mainly, I will maybe skip this uh, introduction or do it very quickly. It turns out if you if you are trying to do a non-smooth uh, non-smooth news and method. There is a notion of the so-called semi-smoothness, which still, thanks to this, you can still get some superlinear convergence. This is from seventy-seven by by Mifflin. Now we we try to go to inclusions, as we saw, just to 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 be able to solve optimization problems, we need to solve uh, inclusions. So how 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 can we design a proper Newton method? And there are some 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 attempts, but typically what happens is that only this single-valued part is is. Um, some differentiation is applied only to this. And the set value, let's say the normal con mapping, the set value part is, a, is as it is. And now, just very recently, this is 2019, Frere, my, my former supervisor, and, and Yuji Altrata from Czech Republic, they came up with the notion of semi smoothness star for set value mappings. And this basically, th thanks to this, you can, you can construct a Newton like method. Where you also differentiate in a way, differentiate also the set valued part, and you get super linear convergence, right? So this is this is the main story, and they they are still developing this, um, but I think it's it's very promising this 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 uh, Newton New, Newton method. And uh, just to show you what semi smoothness is, because in order to define semi smoothness of set valued mapping. Again, just through the graph. So, what it, what what does it mean uh, for a set to be semi-smooth star? And this, there is a very simple characterization using the directional limiting normal cone. And there is also equivalent primal characterization. I didn't show you what is this. This is a Clark tangent cone, directional Clark tangent cone. This is also a new construction, not so important. Uh, this, the PD, the, the, this is an original definition. And to show this, this uh, this is this is a trivial thing because this is simply the polar cone to, to this guy. So very simple. There are also um, like neighborhood-based characterizations, but this is not so not so crucial for us here. Um, and and these are these are these are we, we, this is something which I did. Um, oh, sorry, the, the primal one. Of course, the dual one is known, but the the, the primal one. Uh, but but this primal one actually uh, offers us just some very very basic uh, intuitive understanding of, of what happens why semi smoothness star can guarantee some super linear convergence. So this is the last me message that I would like to convey. Before that, just to just to say that that many 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 sets are semi smooth star. So you can consider, you know, for instance, hearts are are if you consider hard and any finite union unions of closed convex sets. So it's not uh, restrictive assumption at all. It's very commonly satisfied semi smoothness. You would have to construct some, some, of course, some something like sinus one over x to get uh, to violate this property. Or if you consider a, a broken heart, right? Again, you have to broke it <laughs> infinitely many times to 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 violate semi smoothness star. The, the interesting question would be if uh, convex differential must be semi smooth star. And this is not the case, but it's not a difficult example here, but I'm not going to, to, to go through it in the detail. If you would be interesting later uh, during the discussion, we can come back to it, but you can construct an example to show that, well, convex subdifferential does not have to be semi-smooth. Um, um, and um, 
so one, one more thing that turns turns out if you look at the characterizations of semi smoothness um, you can also take a, a one sided version of it all so um, I'll, again i'll i'll not uh, not say too much but long story short if you consider this 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 one sided version of it then you you will you will come to something which which uh, Lewis considered already in 2002 and, and and he called it nearly radiality of of, of set and this was his original definition so there is a very close close connection and actually actually you can you can use just this property nearly radiality of a set to to get the fall and here is here is the the, the interpretation of precisely this property and this this I, I believe clarifies very very easily intuitively why you can get some semi smooth uh, some some sorry some super linear convergence. So if you if you fix some point and some some epsilon, then if you are close enough, then you know you simply know that there is a tangent direction pointing all almost to the solution. So there is some tangent direction such that if you add it to your current iterate, you will get you will get significantly better than you were before. Right, so this is here. If this would be new iterate, so you, you see that the new iterate is, you know, any any threshold that you want times smaller than than your previous iterate, and so this uh, this then enables you to construct something that converges converges quickly and a long set because it's a tangent direction, right? And this is the basis of the semi smooth Stein Newton method, and here is here is just an outline how 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 one could do that. If we have the solution that we are we are looking for, we we start somewhere. Um, if of course in this case we stop, we get to the graph. In order to do anything, we have we have to project somehow project to the graph. But the projection doesn't have to be doesn't have to be precise at all. And then if we are at the graph, we can just select this this direction, uh, uk vk as a solution of such a problem, and go. Of course, if you look at it, this this is really just a conceptual thing because to define this you need to know the solution which you don't know so but this is just something that that can be very easily understood actually what what Kfer and Altrata did is they 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 did a they did a proper um proper um, semi-smooth use method when you do not need to know know this so the step four was 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 different but the idea is very very similar to this but they 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 can actually Compute this this uh, the next direction by solving some linear system, right? So this is just the message, um, and yes, uh, the statement is that yes, you basically you get super linear convergence. The proof is also also very simple, but we will not uh, not do it now. And so this would be all. Um, some 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 references. The the basic books about variational analysis that I find very 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 good are, let's say these four. Um, this is not precisely um, not called at least variational analysis, but of course very very related and very nice book. Um, some papers about about news and method and semi smoothness that I mentioned, and and then some some my my inputs. Um, we did some we did some calculus for the direction directional limiting normal cones, and then this inner calmness star as I mentioned was was uh, defined here first. Then we we using also this notion we we further uh, developed uh, calculus or we we put it into into bigger picture let's say. And then the the last one is about the semi smoothness which I'm still working on. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention. I hope I was not not too long. Um, and if you have any questions, I will be glad to, to answer. Hey, um, so there have been two questions, but uh, about uh, getting the getting the slides. Maybe if you if you uh, sent me the slides, then uh, the respective people who ask can just email me, and I can uh, uh, forward them the slides. Yes, yes. I can also maybe just put it here. Is it? Oh yeah, if you put it in the chat, if you you probably have uh, the rights to put stuff in the chat, yeah, and people. I'm could just know. checking if I'm able to do it. You should get, should you should be able. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Probably just drag and drop. Okay, drag and drop. Should I drop a dragon or what? <laughs> I mean, you can probably also click somewhere. Yes. Okay. 
Okay, so I will I will for sure for sure uh, send it to you. If I in the meantime I might try uh, I might be able to to do it. But if not, I will I will I will send it to you. Uh, well, maybe we uh, we should now open the the floor for for questions. Please uh, go ahead if you if you have any 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 questions or or comments uh, from Matush. Don't don't be shy. <laughs> Maybe I, I'll I'll get the ball rolling, um, okay. Matush. So the 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 set value calculus is 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 very nice. If you, if you want to study, let's say, solution mappings for optimization problems, right? And I did that successfully for for convex problems, right? Mm -hmm. uh, parameterized convex problems because then I know the solutions are the stationary points and you have the calculus for uh, you have the calculus for for the sub differential operators mm -hmm. right but what if my problem isn't convex I mean I can still do the same analysis for the for the for the stationary points but mm -hmm. that's not necessarily the solution set what how do I attack that Okay, so would it fit into? Let me let me show. Um, would it uh, fit into this pattern here? So you have, if I'm not mistaken, you have some parameterized problem here. F can be can be can be anything. So it can be a sum of. So it can be a smooth function plus some identific. Um, yeah, the, the, the trouble is that's not an optimal solution function. That's an optimal value function. That's easy. Uh, the, I mean, of course, optimal, I'm being. I'm you, being you mean argument? You mean argument mapping? Yeah, right? yeah, that's yeah. A, the solution function. No, oh, yes. Yeah, so if you if you are if you are developing this, then the, the the solution mapping appears there, and you are you need to. So so if you if you look into formulas where this this uh, optimal value is is defined, you will also get something for optimal uh, mapping. Okay. But I, I'm not sure if it will be if it will really work for you, but. It is, it is precisely this other pattern. Yes. Um, um, so it, maybe it is, it is true that it is one, one uh, for, for one less developed, but also maybe it's in a way more difficult because precisely maybe, maybe something reasonable can only be done with convexity. It's, it's also possible, but I, I'm not sure. Yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, it's generally a true statement that analyzing the arc min function is a lot harder than analyzing the minimum like the, the optimal value function mm -hmm. that 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 that's certainly true but that but then again from a practical viewpoint usually you're interested in how does the how does the solution change as my parameters change versus how does the optimal value change yeah. usually unless you're you have like an optimal value function approach in, in, in bi-level programming or something like that, then you're actually really interested in, in, in the optimal value only, which, which is fine. But uh, in general, I, I would say the, the former is more, is more challenging, but also more, more interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, and maybe um, to, to give people also, uh, Another perspective on this uh, semi-smooth star business. Um, so, the the semi-smooth Newton algorithm, people didn't uh, semi-smoothness star didn't even exist at the time. Semi-smoothness for well for scalar functions is due to Mifflin, as Matush pointed out. But for for vector valued functions. Uh, it's actually it's a it's a paper by uh, Li Chen Chi and uh, Sun Sun I think, and uh, it's actually not Li Chen Chi. It's a, another Chi and De Feng Sun, and uh, that 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 is a very powerful and very well established algorithm for locally Lipschitz mappings. But then, if you want to analyze let's say the, the sensitivity of these functions, you're gonna run into 
set valued inclusions one one way or the other and then all your scalar value or your vector valued calculus is dead and then you need this the semi smooth star calculus which is really tailored to set valued functions which gives you exactly standard semi smoothness in the locally Lipschitz case so that's that I mean that's <laughs> that's the good thing I mean that that's one of the things that I find very very attractive and that's probably not what you find attractive about it but that's what I what I think is very powerful um do we have more questions where's Simona Simona should have questions because I'm 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 annoying him with normal cone calculus all the time. I was having a coffee break. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy. I would also like to have, but it's 11 p.m., so I I rather not drink any more coffee. <laughs> okay. Um, there are no further questions. I mean, I, I think we can we can end the the official part of the.